Uh, good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Concord Baptist Church. We're glad to see you out in the congregation this morning. We are excited to see what the Lord is going to do today. We're going to start off getting into our worship time uh, with higher ground and then new wine. So if you want to stand with me, we're going to go ahead and start singing praises to Lord.
just lay those before you now, Father. Just ask that you will be with each individual, each family, each each person, God, and just touch them in a way, Lord, that only you know how, God. May they just feel your presence in their life. Father, I pray for our country this week, Lord, as we come before you in the time of election, Lord. We pray. Lord, we know we need you more than ever in our country. And God, we just pray for the hearts of, of all people, Lord, to be touched by you and to vote in a way, God, Lord, that will bring you glory and honor, Lord, and bring this country back to a country on its knees to, to seek you, God, and to put you first in our lives and in our nation. Father, I pray now, Lord, as we just come to you in this service, Lord, that you will remove any distractions, God, that we have in our hearts and our minds and our lives, Lord, that will just cause us from not giving you the true worship that you deserve. Father, we owe you everything. It's only because of you for what we have. So be with us now, God. Just be in this service. And may all that we do be glory to you in your name. And I just pray this in the beautiful name of Jesus.
number four, and we pray that you give them all the glory. I pray, Lord, that you take this altar now, Father, up the building of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Lord of your life, 
He is talking to you this morning. If you're not hearing him, open up those ears. Listen to what the word has to say this morning. To you, to me, to Pastor Travis, to everyone that's in here. Amen. God is in this place. Amen. Amen. See the light, excitement in people today. Uh, man, it's, it's just wonderful to be in the house of the Lord to worship his name. Study his word together, sing praise and joy. Amen. Amen. Are you glad to be here this morning? Amen. I want to invite you to take out your Bibles. Turn over to somebody nearby. Say it's good to see you. Good to see you. Great to see you. And I hope to see you right there next week. Alright, we got the Bibles. Hold them up with me. Let's say this together as we quite often do here at Concord. When I open the Bible, when I open the Bible, God opens his mouth. God opens his mouth. Not just what God has said. Not just what God has said. But is what God is saying. I believe that this morning. Amen. Alright, take your Bibles out and turn to 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings is right before 2 Kings. You have trouble finding that. But we're going to begin, actually, while you're turning to 1 Kings, we're going to begin in the book of Romans. I just want to start there for a moment. But you, you turn to 1 Kings chapter 18. In Romans chapter 12, though, beginning verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let's bow together in prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your word, your truth. And may you teach us, teach us today from your word. May we apply it to our lives and seek to live out your lordship. Your lordship in our lives, Lord. May we live our lives as a reflection of who you are, Jesus. We thank you. May we hear it and apply it and receive it. Last week, um, I began a, a message and shared a message called Voting as a Kingdom Citizen. I invite you, uh, as we certainly have entered into a pivotal time in our nation's history, to go back and uh, view that message if you haven't got a chance to do so. And pray over how you might vote this week if you haven't already done so. And I encourage you to exercise that right to vote in a country where we have that right, praise God. Amen. Amen. Make our voice known. And today, I, I found that today is a, an important message as well as we certainly need to come before the Lord at the time of prayer. You know, we have whitewashed the significance of the altar. We have defiled its significant, its importance. We have destroyed the meaning of God's sacred place of meeting with Him. Many times we have made it a place of shame instead of a place of worship. We have dirtied it to a place only visited in time of need rather than a place of offerings. People altered their life at the altar. And where have we gone wrong, church, to water down the symbolism and the desire to be in a place where God meets with his people? In 1 Kings Beginning in verse 18, I mean in chapter 18, we're going to begin in verse 16 today. As it says this, Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him. Then Ahab went to meet Elijah. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is that you, the one ruining Israel? He replied, if you remember Elijah was a prophet speaking on behalf of God, calling people into repentance. 
Elijah replied, I have not ruined Israel, but you and your father's family have, because you've abandoned the Lord's commands, followed the Baals. Now summon all Israel to meet me at Mount Carmel, along with 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab summoned all the Israelites and gathered the prophets at Mount Carmel. Let's we'll stop there for just a moment. Now you have to realize that when you get serious about serving God, you're 100% sold out. Right? 100%. 100%. You will, when, when you are sold out for the Lord, we have to realize that you are going to be viewed as a troublemaker. Why? Because most people, most people today are completely satisfied to be, to live around the altar, but you have chosen to live on the altar as a living sacrifice unto him. Most people today, or a lot of people today, are completely satisfied, as long as I can just be near the altar. But when you are 100% sold out to the Lord, you have made a decision that you are going to live on the altar. Years before this time period, here in Second, First Kings chapter eighteen, unknown people had built an altar here. On this high mountain, they worshipped, offering up sacrifices to the, to the true and the living God. With the offerings, they sought fellowship with God. They sought uh, acceptance before Him. They sought cleansing from their sin that plagued their lives. And in this place, unknown people had built an altar and worshiped the Lord God. And that altar had stood as a visible sign of the reality of the true and living God for years and years and years. And it had testified that people once worshiped him as the most high God. And something dreadful occurred in that land faster than anyone could have imagined possible. The civil government was corrupted. The people approved of new directions with progressive attitudes that demonstrated to the world that they were just like the nations around them. Of course, the thought began to grow that went farther and farther away from God. And spiritual dryness was taking shape. Only a dwindling number of spokes, spokesmen for the Lord stood opposed to the flood of wickedness that was invading their land. Only a few men spoke out against the advance of evil. As increasing numbers of prophets compromised with wickedness, embracing the worship of Balaam and Ashram, altars that once covered the land were now being torn down, replaced with Asherah poles, worship of false gods. The sacred places where the living God had worshipped had been worshipped were true were transformed into houses of prostitution. And this altar also was torn down and the stones were scattered. But now one man, passionate about his desire to glorify the true and living God, he flashed upon the scene, Elijah. <coughs> Elijah the Tishbite appeared, and this man would bring its nation to its knees. Kings would be reduced to searching for water. The people would be shamed, and even worshipers of the Lord God would tremble before him. Yet he was the, he was the last opportunity for a nation to turn again to the living God. The rhythm of his life and service before the Lord is met with growing intensity as the last, until at last the prophets of Baal, the king, and many of the people of the land are gathered on this high mountain, Mount Carmel, where the altar had once stood. And this, this strange man proposed a contest unlike any of those gathered had ever witnessed before. And here it is in verse 21. So Elijah approached all the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal follow him, but the people didn't answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, 
I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord. But the Bible's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. They are to choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces, place it on the wood, but not light the fire. I will prepare the other bull, place it on the wood, but not light the fire. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of, uh, of the God, the Lord God. I mean, the God who answers the fire with fire, he is God. All the people answered, that's fine. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, since you are so numerous, <coughs> choose for yourselves one bull, prepare it first, then call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. So they took the bull, gave that they he gave them, prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from the morning until noon, saying, Answer us! But there was no sound. No one answered. They danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them. He said, Shout loudly, for he's a God. Maybe he's thinking it over. Don't you just like this? I love this in Elijah. A little sarcasm he throws in here. Maybe he's wandered away. Or maybe he's on the road. Perhaps he's sleeping. And will wake up, they shouted loudly and, and cut themselves with knives and spears according to their custom until blood gushed over them. It's a weird custom. All afternoon they kept raving until the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no sound. No one answered. No one paid attention. A full day of this went by. This left the 450 prophets exhausted, unable to continue their religious rants. It is at this point the man of God reveals the one whom he serves. As for the people, it could be said that they had heard a rumor of God, but they had not known God. <coughs> In respect, this contest of Mount Carmel is a parable to our own spiritual age of decline. As our world grows ever more religious and we affirm our spirituality, whatever that might mean, fewer and fewer of our fellow citizens appear to know the true and living God of the universe. People have heard a rumor of God, but very few have evidence of actually knowing Him. The fruit is not always evident. Professing Christians of this day appear eager to join every noisy march, but many times they're not quite certain why they are marching. We insist on inoff inoffensive prayers at every civic event. Prayers that ask nothing of God, though they make us feel a little more spiritual. Nevertheless, Few of the professed people of God are prepared to engage in prevailing prayer. We who name the name of Christ are willing to go to a service designed to make us feel good about ourselves. And even if, if that service uh, entertains us, all the better. But the preacher had better not make us feel uncomfortable. We eagerly participate in the rituals of the faith, but we can't honestly say that we have ever met the risen Savior in Acts. In short, we have forgotten who we are and from where we come. When we need a truthful prophet, we're unlikely to receive him should he appear. When the prophets of Baal had exhausted their ritualistic chants, Elijah called the people to come near. For most, it's unlikely that they had ever heard a prophet of God. Or if they had heard a prophet, it was years prior that they dismissed what was said at times. And to address the need of the land, it would be necessary to hear again what a man of God might say here. The people needed to hear the voice of God echoed through this man. What we witness is nothing short of a call to return to the ancient past that were long forgotten God, through Jeremiah, he issued precisely the exact same 
calling on another occasion in Jeremiah 6, 16. He said, the Lord said to his people, you are standing at a crossroads. So consider your path. Ask where the old reliable paths are. Ask for the path that leads to blessings and follow it. If you do, you'll find rest for your soul. But they said, we will not follow it. How very relatable this attitude is to the people of God in Jeremiah's day. How very even much like our world today. We know what is right. It's trumpeted from multiple pulpits, yet we have no stomach to do what is right. It is too difficult to be godly. It's too demanding to serve God and His commands. It's, it is inconvenient to live righteously. So we stubbornly insist that we won't live that way. We'll just continue living in the sins that we are engulfed in. Ancient past for the people of Israel meant that people must humble themselves before God. They must obey His commands. They must seek His face. must honor Him in all things. And the people performed all the rites and rituals perfectly. They had the outward expression of religion nailed. However, transformation of the heart, it was completely lacking. It wasn't there. The prophets and the preachers of the old, they held some truths tenaciously, refusing to compromise, unwilling to. To deviate from what they knew to be true. And his word was received as authoritative. The word of the Lord was received as accurate. I'm not contending that prior generations were perfect. They were sinners, just as we are. I am, however, stating, as quoted by Michael Stark, that we're living off the interest, in many cases, of past deposits of righteousness invested in Consequence, consequently, the attitudes that characterize some of our modern stain, uh, some of our modern society, they stain the churches, ensuing that the altars of the Lord are cast down and, and left in ruins. So, what did Elijah do? Verse thirty. Then he repaired the Lord's altar that had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. Whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel will be your name. And he built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord. As Elijah would need to build again the altar of the Lord, so Christians in this day, they're responsible to raise the altar of the Lord. I'm not saying that we need to build physical structures for the glory of God. No, I'm saying that we must do the things that reveal his presence among us. If there will ever be revival in our day, then we must prepare ourselves so that we can be used by God's Spirit. Church, we need to get back to a place where the Bible is held as authoritative and accurate. Christians, we need to come to a place of holding that salvation is God's gift. It's offered freely. Amen? When this happens, when... when when this happens, we will find that salvation is revealed through a godly life, that there's evidence of fruit, that we can't just profess it. We must possess it in our own personal lives. Fathers must embrace the responsibility to serve as spiritual leaders for their own families. They're, these are the minimum requirements for the altar of God to be rebuilt. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. Thus, if we believe that Jesus is unchanging, if, if we believe that his word does not change, and then of necessity we must accept the responsibility to live according to what is revealed through his word. Christ charged us to obey his commands. John 15, 14 says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Others may argue that living according to the word would... It's going to result in exposure to hostility from the world. Make no, no mistake about it. It will. No doubt. The world does not love exposure of its rebellion to the will of God. Second Timothy, in chapter 2, Paul began his service among the faithful. He was warning of trials for those who would follow the Savior. And at the conclusion of his very first missionary tour, 
It said they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, though many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. It's not a matter of if you will go through trials, if you're fully devoted to the Lord. It's just a matter of when. Back to our scripture in 1 Kings 18, verse 32, it says he, he built an altar with the stones in the name of the Lord, then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold four gallons. Next, he arranged the wood, cut up the bull, placed it on the wood. He said, fill four water pots with water, pour it on the offering to be burned on the wood. And then he said a second time, and they did it a second time. And then he said a third time. And they did it the third time. So the water ran all around the altar and even filled the trench with water. <clears throat> so a sopping, wet sacrifice. At the time for the offering of the evening sacrifice, the prophet Elijah approached the altar and said, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that your word, at your word, I have done all these things. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that the people will know that you, the Lord your God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust. And I love this part. It licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell face down and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Amen. Whew. I would have loved to be in that moment. Yes. To see Elijah call down the heavens and the Lord bring fire down to consume the wet, sopping wet altar and even lick up the water that was in the trench around it. I would have probably looked over at the prophets of Baal and said, that's my God. <laughs> Perhaps a little Elijah's sarcasm would have come out. What is needed, though, from among our churches is fire from the heaven. A holy revival of the faith. Revival will not come through rigid organization. It's unfortunate, though. In some respects, we have about organized the Holy Spirit out of many of our churches today. Many times we plan and plan and plan and do, do all we can do, and, and there's never prayer, there's never, there's never seeking the Spirit, and we end up quenching the Spirit out of our desire to keep everything the way we want it instead of how God wants it. We get so rigid about how things are supposed to go that we forget to be spirit-led. The prayer that Elijah offered up before the Israelites was directed to the living God. The prophet saw one great thing from the Lord God. Look back. Look, look back. Verse 37. Is this what it says? Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that the people will know me. Is that what it says? <laughs> what does it say? Answer me so the people will know what? <laughs> the people will know you. Answer me, Lord, so the people, I don't, I don't care what good about me, answer me so that the people will know you are the living God. Hmm. He offered this prayer up. He had one goal in mind that they, that that the Lord God might be known as God. Elijah, long, his longing was for God to be glorified before his people. And if we ever witness the power of God in this day and in our midst, we must seek his glory above all else. Even Jesus taught us, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, right? James said about this prayer uh, that Elijah offered, he said, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. 
He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Elijah was simply a man committed to God and seeking his glory and desiring to be in his presence. That's who Elijah was. So much of the modern prayer life, though, it seeks out personal comfort. Right? Requests to make life better. Requests to make life easier. Ask that we may not experience difficulties of routine of life. Our focus is us often rather than the Lord God. We as believers and followers of Jesus would do well to reflect on what we're seeking. When we petition the Lord our God and, and transform our prayers so that we seek God's glory. Perhaps this is one of the great reasons many churches see so little power among them and, and why little transformation happens in their midst. Perhaps it's so much of self-seeking rather than God-seeking. How different the gospel is to many modern prosperity and pretty roses preachers. Some are eager for any results that they're willing to water down the demands of the master and seek to make the way smooth so that no one will be turned away by the challenge of a Christian life. Well, the fact is, Jesus said, deny yourselves, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Jesus said to the woman at the well who was caught in sin, he said, go, live your life, leave your life of sin. You see, it's a challenge. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a big calling. It's not just, oh, just believe in Jesus and then go live your life however you want to. No, that's not, that's not what the Bible teaches by any means, is it? No. It's a high calling. And it's one that must be taken seriously. Anyone can come to Jesus, but the thing is, you've got to be willing to <coughs> surrender to Jesus. The Christian life is not an easy life. Not if it's real. Not if it's real. The call of the master is to follow, knowing that the world will be not be enthusiastic about your choice. Praying to the Father, Jesus testified, I have given my disciples your word. And the world has hated them because they're not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. I did not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth, he says in John 17. Now let me ask you. Do you long for God's glory? Do you long for him to be honored among us? Do you long for him to receive praise? Though it may mean that you must be humbled. Until we come to that position, we should not even entertain the thought that we shall see the power of God displayed in our midst. Until we are ready to be humbled, church, then how can we even imagine God revealing his power? Perhaps it is many of the people who call themselves to be children of God who actually need to be saved. I know that's a big statement. It's a bold statement. But we have a lot of people all over the world and all over the U.S. and even in our communities that claim to know of Christ. And they claim to be called a Christian or they claim to be a child of God or they've got their ticket to heaven. But they have never fully surrendered to Jesus Christ as Lord. And I have a big fear that one day when they enter the kingdom of heaven and enter the gates... They will be faced with a sad response from the Lord where he says, depart from me, I never knew you. It seems probable that many of his professed people have settled for a profession without transformation. But what about this altar that's being built? What is it about? An altar was a structure upon which offerings, such as a sacrifice, that were made for religious purposes. It was actually a raised platform with a flat surface, and there are over 400 references to altars in the Bible. 
The word altar was first used in Genesis chapter 8 when Noah built an altar to the Lord after he left the ark. However, this idea was present as early as Genesis chapter 4 when Cain and Abel, they brought their sacrifices to the Lord. They most likely presented their offerings on some type of altar, even though the word altar is not used in that passage. An altar always represents a place of consecration, a place of, of, of separation, of, of holiness. Before God gave his law to Moses, men made altars wherever they were out of whatever material that was available. An altar was often built to commemorate an encounter with God that had a profound impact upon someone. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Gideon. They all built altars. They worshipped after having a unique encounter with God. Every one of them. An altar usually represented a person's desire uh, to, to devote and separate himself fully to the Lord. That God had worked in, in someone's life in such a way that a person desired to create something physical in order to memorialize it. Elijah, he took 12 stones. 12 of them. One for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And it was on the altar that God rained down fire. And he put the, the false worshipers in their place. Sometimes God himself commanded that an altar be built that after he had delivered someone in a miraculous way. Such an altar would be a memorial to help future generations and generations remember the mighty works of the Lord. When God gave instructions for the tabernacle, he had also detailed instructions for the kind of altar the courtyard should contain. On this altar, the people made sacrifices to God. They accepted as atonement for their sin. And it was to have four even horn-like projections, one on each corner. It had to be large enough to hold sacrifices like bulls and sheep and goats. For the temple that Solomon built, the altar was made of pure gold. But in the broadest sense, an altar is merely a designated place where a person devotes himself to someone or something. Many church buildings have altars for prayer. We call this today the altar. Now front. Many churches have altars today. They come to the altar at a wedding. Come to the, we had one yesterday, celebrated. Paul and Summer came to the altar before God, made a covenant with God. We come to the altar for communion or other sacred purposes, to the altar for prayers. Some Christians create their own personal altars for personal worship as visual reminders. As Romans 12 one says, to present yourself as a living sacrifice. Every human heart has an invisible altar where the war between flesh and spirit rages. When we surrender areas of our lives to the control of the Holy Spirit Church, we are in effect laying that area on the altar before God. In other words, they built altars to mark spiritual milestones that they had. Like when they would stack stones to mark where they saw God move. Altars mark the fact that we worship Him. It is intended to pull us away from self-reliance. We are reminded that the journey is not about us, it's all about God. Amen? Amen. Our altars declare the glory of God, the riches of God. To the watching world, altars were intended to keep us moving. Altars declare God's faithfulness. The altar was a place of sacrifice. It was a place of atonement of sin and a place of thanksgiving and forgiveness. Let me ask you, church, when people look at us, are they reminded of what God, what he did? Are they reminded what he did is a work of God? When they look at you, are they reminded of what God did is a work of Him? When people look at us, do they see the glory and the riches of God? When people look at us, are they inspired to move as well closer to the Lord? 
When people look at us, do our lives declare his faithfulness? When people look at us, do they say, look at the story that God is writing through Darren's life. Look at the story that God's writing through Hannah's life, through Jimmy's life, through Judy's life, through Jamie's life. Look at the story that God is writing through their life. Is, when people look at us, are they drawn to the altar of the Lord? they see the difference in us. Elijah wasn't pointing to himself. He was pointing to God. Let me ask you, church, this place, this place we call the altar, we've been a church in existence for 220 years. Praise the Lord. Amen. This altar <coughs> is a place where many generations past people have come to this altar and prayed tears asking God to forgive give them, asking God to, to move in the lives of their families asking God to move in the lives of their church, asking God to help them to be a better man or a woman of God, a better wife, a better husband, a better father, a better mother the, this place, this altar has been a place where people have come and brought their offerings before the Lord and the work of the ministry of God has gone out and the kingdom of God has been declared. This, this, this altar that we have here has been a place where couples have come together and made a covenant before God and they sanctify their marriage in order to bring glory and honor to God. This altar is a place where people have come and they, they've said, I'm, I'm done living for me, I'm ready to live for you. This place, this altar has been a place where people come and they've, they've had questions about what decisions to make in life. And they say, God, I need your wisdom. I need your discernment. I don't want to make a decision on my behalf or, or on, on my knowledge because your ways are much higher than my ways. I want to be at your feet and submissive to your will. So I'm asking you to speak to me while I'm here at this altar, recognizing that, God, you are God and you are God alone. This altar, this altar has been a place of life change for people. Not just for the people that come to the altar, but even the ones who have been lifted up at the altar. Let me ask you, church, where are the tear stains on the altar? Where are the torn and worn spots on the altar steps from the knees of God's people? Where are the brothers and sisters to pray and lay hands on those who kneel? Where are the eyes looking for a looking just for a gap in the crowd so that they can place themselves in a place of humbleness? Because the altar is filled with hearts of broken people seeking the face of God. Where is the passion and the burden for a soul that it drives us to the altar? Church, wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if every year we just had to come and replace the carpet at the altar because there was no carpet left? Amen. Amen. Wouldn't it be a beautiful thing if, if you got right here to the altar and you, you can't even find a place to get? There's so many people at the altar, so many lives that are changing. So many people willing to humble themselves before God. Let me tell you, church, the devil has done a great job at keeping his people I mean, keeping the people at bay stuck in their pews people want the floodgates of heaven to open up we want the get floodgates of blessings to pour down oh we want the spirit to rage but when god wants us to actually move and go to the altar or go outside these walls and share jesus oh no i'm staying right where i'm at i'm not moving I'm not saying one always has to come to the altar. You know me better than that. What I am saying is, when was the last time you came in desperate need and desire to seek the face of God? When have you laid your life on the altar of your heart? Church, I want God to show up and move out. 
I want, to I want God to show up and show out. I'm sorry. Sometimes when God calls us to move out of our pews, sometimes there's such a resistance of the flesh. We hold it in. We begin to think, oh, what will my Sunday school teacher think? What will my husband think? My wife think? What will my children think? What will my parents think? What will the preacher think? What will the deacons think? Who cares about all that? Amen. Who cares? It's not about any of those other people. This is a place where people come to meet God. Mm -hmm. There's coming a time, he says, when you'll worship me in spirit and in truth. Church, we've got to quit worrying and start praying. We want revival, and we've got to get broken. When God calls and speaks, it's funny how many deaf people are, there are in our churches. Church, we've got to quit sitting in the pews, just playing religion, just professing Jesus, and actually start possessing him. We have to stop burdening ourselves to please the world and start offering our pleas to him. I read about a bride who sought advice on how to deal with her nerves as she was going to the altar. At the start of her wedding, the pastor, he, he suggested she remember to keep her eyes first on the eye. Then, upon turning the corner, just focus on the altar. And finally, as she got near the altar, then she was to focus on the groom. And she did exactly that on her wedding day. And she was heard saying to herself, I alter him. I alter him. I alter him. Let me ask you what will happen when we make the altar the altar. And we start treating it a place. It as a place of meeting with him. Our Lord and Savior. I alter him. pray today that if you've never met him that he is not the Lord and Savior of your life that today would be the day that you would take a step of faith that you would move into the aisle that you would come to the altar to meet him and have a face to face conversation with him to be, to be personal he's a personal guy and he wants to save you from your sin. And he wants to help you through life. He wants to be the Lord of your life. If you'll allow him to be. So I invite you to come to Jesus today. I invite you to seek his face. It doesn't matter to anyone else the reason you come to the altar. The reason you bow down before him. What matters is that we are people seeking him. As the group comes and leads us in our time of invitation, they're going to be signing a song. Oh, come, Jesus, come. I invite you to come. I don't invite you to, to focus so much upon him, on them, but so focus upon him. And I believe that's what they would want. Isn't that right, Cindy? Focus on him during this time. And won't you come, let's seek the Lord's face together. The altar is open as we worship. Jesus come.
beautiful. This is Chad and Jennifer Green. Um, they have come today and they have come to formally be united in membership with our church body. Uh, they have both born again believers. I'll take that as an affirmative. Um, they are both born again believers. They've been baptized. Uh, Jennifer comes uh, from Westminster. Um, and Chad comes from and we get Long Branch. Long Branch. Uh, so we're looking forward to having them as members today. And uh, we'll just praise God for bringing a new family into our family. Amen. Um, I want to close this out in prayer. But look forward to just continuing serving with you. I invite them to join us in the back. And you can express your love to them and your prayers for them. As they continue to be a part of the body of Christ here at Concord, and get them plugged in, and serve them right alongside of us. Amen? Amen. And we just continue to be about building His kingdom. Amen? Um, we're going to leave out pretty, really quickly uh, the mission team who's headed to Candler. So if you can make your way out to the church fans pretty quickly so that we can make the most of daylight, because unfortunately we lost another hour of daylight last night. Um, so I know we had to turn our clocks back to doom and gloom. I hate doing that. Uh, let's pray together. And I'm going to invite you guys, if you'll head on back to the back there, and you can share your love with them as they as you Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Lord, I thank you for your altar and the place, God, that you have given us to, to meet with you, the significance of this place. Lord, help us to... That our, we offer our bodies and our lives as a living sacrifice unto you. Seek your face, your will, to glorify your name. The name above all names, his name is Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.